I was born in Tel Aviv um, many, many years ago. And my parents were newcomers uh, to the state of Israel. They arrived at Israel in 1949. Um, basically, they were born in Czechoslovakia, which is, uh, I think, at that time it was uh, in the years between Second, First and Second World War, it was a big privilege as uh, Czechoslovakia was a magnificent democracy. Uh, but things has changed. Uh, towards the end of the 1930s, as you may well know. And um, their fate turned into the worst. Um, my mother lost uh, a sister. She was uh, in the first transport to Auschwitz. She was number 474. Uh, and then my mother was married uh, before. She was a medical student at the University of Bratislava. And she was expelled of the university because she was a Jew. And she married an, an already Jew, made uh, an already um, medical doctor who was a very famous gynecologist in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and they were uh, expelled to a small city where they spent the years until 1944, when she and her husband and uh, her parents and his parents were sent to Auschwitz. Um, she was the only survivor. And she came back and she finished her studies. I'm telling this very mundane, in a very mundane way on purpose, because this is a chronology. And later on, I will put emotion into the uh, very dry tale. Uh, she finished her, finished her studies, and then she went for two years to work uh, in the mountains with uh, survivors who had tuberculosis. Many survivors came back with tuberculosis. Uh, and my mother specialized in lung uh, diseases. And uh, then two years later, she went to a hospital to work there. And she met my father, who had almost the same path. He was uh, among the force battalion, work battalions, who were expelled to the Russian front. Mm -hmm. He fell into the Russian hands, which saved his life, actually. I grew up knowing that it was the Soviets who saved the world. Okay. And uh, by the way, in a very dear price. Um, and um, he came back, and he also went to finish his studies of medicine. That was in, at Prague University. And the ever, only ever condition he posed to my mother before they got married. Uh, and they met, by the way, at a demonstration of the 1st of May, which was already showing that Czechoslovakia was going to be a communist state. Uh, his only condition was that they will move to Israel because, as my father put it, enough for being a, a minority and refugees. And so they arrived at, uh, at, at Israel. 1949 it was already Israel. Uh, after, by the way, a, a whole odyssey because uh, Czechoslovaks wouldn't let them out because they wouldn't let out doctors. This is a story which I spare. And they landed. In, my father was the first. He landed in February of 49. My mother came six months later due to difficulties of uh, the exodus. And they started their life in Israel. No parents and no, nobody to help. My mother had a brother and a sister who immigrated in 1938. But they were also poor, like, as they say, church mice. And um, they started their lives with their own bare hands, 10 fingers and two hands, and motivation. And I grew up in a house which was a very happy house. Uh, my parents cherished life every day of their lives. My mother is 102 today. Uh, <laughs> by the end of my lecture, I'll show, I'll show a picture of her. Uh, and they worked all their lives for themselves and for the state, um, loving every minute of it, and actually not ever, not for one day, taking the state of Israel for granted. And there is something in an atmosphere of a family which, which is absorbed into you as an adult. Uh, and it also absorbed, to a large extent, my 
uh, academic work. Actually, not to a large extent, to a pivotal extent. Um, when I finished my master's degree, which was about the Shoah in Slovakia, uh, my father, we used to meet every Wednesday, and my father took me to, a, to our Wednesday coffee, and he, without even asking me would I want to go on PhD, that was not a question, because education is the one thing that nobody can take away from you, that is the message. Um, my father told me, you should write the PhD about the story of the survivors in Israel. And I was sure, by the, it wasn't at the, at the Middle Ages, it was in the 19, by the late 1980s. And I went to my teacher and rabbi, Yuda Bauer, and I told him, listen, I, I thought it's a fascinating topic. And I went to him and he said, well, finally, somebody thought to write about this topic. That means that until the late 1980s, nobody thought that the story of the survivors after the war and the story of specifically the survivors who immigrated to Israel is worth telling. And let me tell you, this is such a huge saga that you won't believe, and I will try to unfold it to you. Uh, and ever since then, it's now a couple of decades, I've been doing all kinds of work about the survivors. Uh, I have, at this point in time, 14 PhD students doing all kinds of aspects. Just to quote one, who is already, she's already a PhD, uh, Rachel, who did a work on uh, Holocaust survivors uh, and, and the medical services in Israel. And I can tell you that the first two schools, the first two courses of, of medicine at Mount Scopus in 1949 and 50 were comprised of 90% survivors of the Holocaust. Just, that is just an illustration of what my, my students are, are finding. You know that the first pilots of Israeli Air Force were also 75% were survivors of the Holocaust. This is absolutely an ununderstandable phenomena, which we would like to crack. So without further ado, I will start with uh, uh, my uh, lecture. Um, Basically, I, I like to read and call this lecture Survivors of the Holocaust, Myth and Reality. Uh, this is a name, I have to say, that was given to me by uh, uh, the AABGU. They thought it is better, but basically my lecture is about Survivors of the Holocaust, Myth and Reality. Um, there is one more aspect to what I'm going to speak about. Uh, I have a great struggle in the Israeli educational system of how to teach the Shoah. Uh, we are now seven, al almost eight decades after the Shoah, and um, Shoah was not always taught in Israel, as you may know. We started teaching the Shoah actually only at the beginning of the 1980s. There were no books. There were actually not many uh, research done uh, academic research about the history of the Shoah. Um, and we are teaching it absolutely with an emphasis on the issue of victimhood. Now, there are four chapters in the story of the Shoah. The first one is, of course, the history of the European Jews. Who were the European Jews? Who were the victims? What did they contribute to Europe's culture? What did they contribute to the world culture? What an evolution, a huge evolution, they evoked on the soil of Europe and to the world. Just to name Einstein and Freud, for instance. I mean, the 20th century, the 21st century would not be as they are, has not, has not it been for the Jewish contribution. The Jews in Europe created a whole civilization. None of our young people know what that civilization was. Marcuse, Kafka, I just don't want to bring you a, a shopping bag. They never heard this name, these names. So first is, who were the Jews who died? I don't care about the number six million. I want to know who they were when they were alive. 
What did we lose there in the years 1939-1945? And we lost so much. The second chapter is, of course, the democracy in Germany. And unfortunately, we live in a times where democracy is at a crisis. How come a huge, magnificent democracy that was Germany in the 1930s, you should read the Constitution. I didn't see such a, an advanced liberal constitution in my life. How come somebody wakes up in January of 1933, he opens his eyes, and there is no longer democracy. Democracy does not perish overnight. There is a corrosion of years until one day you wake up. And if you're not alert in time and you don't see the red lights, that will be our fate over and over again. And in this time of crisis, this is a magnificent, most important chapter. The third one is, of course, the, the years 1939 to 1945, when the Holocaust happened and the final solution was operated. I don't see any merit, educational merit, in this chapter. Because in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, they said, thou shalt not murder. This is the only lesson from the Shoah. And then there is the day after. And that's the present. That's every day of our lives. What do we do with this unprecedented event in human history? This un un unprecedented, uh, let's say, uh, atrocity in human history. I'm dealing with this part. And I think for educational purposes, this is the most important thing. What do we take as Jews and as human beings, or let's say it in a different order, as human beings as, as Jews from the story of the Shoah? And there is a great teaching that the survivors left us. I don't believe in education through words. I believe only in education through deeds. You can tell your child never to cross a road uh, when it's not green. And once you've done it because you didn't have time and you took him, that's the end of the lesson. So let's start. I would like to start my presentation with a motto. And the motto is by Abba Kovner. Abba Kovner was the head of the uh, underground at the Vilnius Ghetto. He is, by the way, the one who erected the, the Diaspora Museum in Tel Aviv University, Betat Futsot. Uh, he was uh, a Shomer Atzair, which is a left or a youth movement. Uh, and um, what he gave us is also the Ad Mordechai Museum. He was a poet and a writer and a very, very impressive man who never actually, all his life, was speaking about the Shoah, but in a very different and humane way. Um, he is a very good start to what we are trying to say. Um, by the way, he was the, the first one to, to meet with the Israeli soldiers on the world, on the, on the earth of uh, Europe. Okay, this is the first part. Uh, and I would like you to react. Let's make it a kind of a, a bit of, of a dialogue. The teaching of the Shoah is first and foremost an action of an ongoing soul search within ourselves and through eternity. In such a soul search, the answers never appear before the questions. I remember what I cannot forget. This is in brackets. The first two paragraphs are the most important. What is actually Abba Kovner tell us in this statement? The first thing, I'm not putting you into a test. <laughs> the first one, the first saying he's saying that he is putting an emphasis on the inner dialogue between the Jewish, inside the Jewish society. He has no business in taking responsibility out, in exporting responsibility. What he cares about mostly is the inner dialogue within the Jewish world after the Shoah. As he said, is foremost an action of ongoing soul search within ourselves. 
Let us get up every morning and see how today we stood in the exam or the trial of the Shoah. Let us see that we understood what the Shoah means in our personal lives as victims. That means that victims or victimhood is an obligation, not a privilege. The second thing he says, in such a search, the answers never appear before the questions. That means that the main thing to do is to put a question mark all the time and every day. And it's an ongoing process. It will never end. But that means something else. That means that nobody has the right, actually, to dictate to you what the lessons of the Shoah are. This is a personal process within yourself. You yourself have has to moderate for yourself what you take from the Shoah. I mean, if our politicians in Israel stand and tell you that the lesson of the Shoah is that we should have an atomic bomb, that's their lessons. I don't necessarily agree. I, I for myself, think that the be best message of the Shoah is what I'm going to tell you at the end of the lecture. But that's not an obligation for you. That's Hannah. It's an individualistic process. After we've seen the motto, then we have to define to ourselves who are survivors of the Holocaust. This is a very complicated question. Um, because I can, I can ask you provocatively, are the German Jews who immigrated, like, say, 1937, survivors of the Holocaust? It's a good question. It's a very important question. Because in 1937, the Germans did not decide at that time about the, the final solution. Actually, they did not kill Jews until 1937. Pogroms, anti-Jewish laws, we've known all through the history, and we never called them Shoah. By the way, when we speak about restitution from the Germans, the German Jews got the largest sums of money. This is all kinds of paradoxes in the story of the post-war. But when I went to my research in, in, in writing the PhD, I had, this is the first question that you ask, what my basic concept, what does it mean? How can I count survivors of the Holocaust if I haven't defined them? Now today, there is a schools that say that every Jew who lives today is a survivor of the Holocaust. That, of course, is... Our, our spoiled children who don't even understand the, 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 the beginning of the term to be hungry, they are not survivors of the Holocaust. You don't know, we don't know, I guess, maybe you do, but most of us don't know what hunger means. I'm telling my students sometimes, I'm hungry in Yom Kippur because I fast. But I've, I've had a large dinner before that, and I'm sure that once Yom Kippur is over, there is food on my table. But what is hunger that you know that by the end of the day, it will be the same as yesterday? And tomorrow will be the same as the day before that? That there will be never food for a long time, and you don't know how long. Nobody, of, nobody can really grasp that in our reality. So we are not all survivors of the Holocaust. Um, before I... I should, in a minute, give you the definition of survival of the Holocaust, but I wanted, in order to understand the post-war era, we have to define, first of all, ground zero. This is a number, the numbers of uh, a, com a couple of countries and the death toll in them. I, I have it in Hebrew, but it doesn't matter. The numbers are um, uh, international. This is... Uh, the number of murdered, this is the number in 1939. Now, the first, th this is Germany. This is Germany out of 566,000, almost one, uh, 140,000 were murdered. Hungary, 825,000 before the war, and 
over half a million murdered, by the way, in only six weeks. Uh, Poland, uh, out of 300,000 uh, uh, million, three million, actually more, but three million uh, Jews were murdered. These are the numbers. This is the Soviet Union. You can see the numbers. This is, in a way, how we get to approximately uh, more or less six million. Of course, we don't have the exact numbers. But you can see what Shoah means. Shoah means actually the wiping up from the face of the earth of the European Jews. This is ground zero. Ground zero is a complete, utterly big destruction. Um, usually we say that by the 8th of May, 1945, Second World War was over. The Jewish end of Shoah is very different from that of Second World War because actually the Jews, the Shoah ended for them the day the place they were staying was liberated. So there are Jews who were already liberated in February of 1944 as the Soviet, Un Soviet army was moving from east to west. Can you imagine the paradox? February of 1944, the Hungarian Jews are still believing that they will make it through the war. Because only by the end of March, beginning of April, the Germans conquered Hungary in 1944. So the Jewish fate is really very dramatically different from one place to another. So 8th of May, or 9th of May, depends which country, is actually the end of the world the end of the war for the world. So let me give you just two pictures from May of 1945, which will explain to you the difference between V-Day, as they call it, and the end of Second World War or the end of the Shoah in the eyes of the Jews. This is in the British Parliament in one of its uh, uh, outskirts. Uh, they all imitate uh, Churchill's uh, V. Uh, you can see the joy, you can see the, the, the re relaxation, the relief. And this is a picture of uh, uh, the liberation for the Jews. I don't think I need to say words because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. It's a completely different story. Through V-Day and Glenn Miller singing, and the confetti in New York, and name it whatever, and the, this uh, sailor kissing the nurse in the iconic picture. Through these pictures, one is a, is a feeling of despair and, and, and misery, and the other one is, of course, of utmost joy and the beginning of a new era. Now, who is a survivor? Um, I've done... I worked on, on, the, on this definition like a year until I, I was satisfied with myself. The Jews of continental <laughs> Europe who suffered under Nazi occupation or influence both directly, camps, ghetto, forced labor, partisans hiding, or indirectly, escape, expulsion, deportation. From this definition, I can take further and count and give you numbers and give you uh, periods and etc. If you have problem with def definition, that's okay. It's an ongoing discussion. But until today, and I wrote my PhD, I don't know, 25 years ago, uh, this is the accepted definition of survivors of the Holocaust. Of course, it poses quite a big problem in Israeli discourse because it asks, for instance, are the Moroccan Jews survivors of the Holocaust, which is a very delicate and loaded question in Israeli um, atmosphere of today. The answer, as, as far as I'm concerned, no, they are not. Um, now I want to describe to you ground zero. In the minds of the people, not only in numbers. I have read thousands of testimonies by survivors Almost all of them describe Day of Liberation as the hardest days of their lives. Not Shoah, the Day of Liberation. 
is the hardest day of them all. I can understand that. But I want you to hear the words of Itzhak Zuckerman. Itzhak Zuckerman was the deputy of Mordechai Nilevich, who was the commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He survived. Anilevich did not survive. And he immigrated to Israel in 1947. And he was the establisher of Kibbutz Lochamea Ghetto, or the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, and the first ever museum of the Holocaust in that kibbutz, of which I will speak a little bit later. To understand the depths of this text, I have to tell you three things. When the Germans occupied Poland, many, many, many Jews escaped eastward towards Russia. Among them were actually all the leaders of the Jews uh, in, the, in the between war era. The Jews were actually left in their hardest time without the leaders of the first rank during Second World War. Among those who escaped were many leaders of the, youth the Zionist youth movements. Among them were Begin, and among them were Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was the head of the leftist uh, Dror and the uh, Shomer Atzair in Poland. There is one slight difference. They ended up in one of the cities, Rovno, which was actually not occupied by the Germans, but by the Soviets. And for a time, it was a no man's land, not Soviets and not Germans. And the leaders of the youth movement were sitting there. And they dreamed all their life to go to Palestine. And they were sitting there, and suddenly they asked, what the hell are we doing? Our children, who we were their leaders in the youth movement, stayed behind. How can we neglect them? This was inconceivable. And so they, in a historic decision, in a, in a decision that was judged by history, they decided to give up the dream of Eretz Israel, and they turned back, and they went back to be with their children in the ghetto. Ani Levitch was like that. Yitzhak Zuckerman was like that. His wife to be, Sylvia Lubetkin, the great hero, was like that. Chaika Grossman, later on a member of the parliament, of Israeli parliament, was like that. And they are the only leadership from the first rank which was reconstituted during the Shoah. I want to tell you that this is not all. In 1941, you know that it's, it's a very uncommunicative era. There are no Facebook. There was no Facebook. There was no paper. The Jews were closed in a ghetto. So how did they get information? They sent emissaries, looking like Gentiles, blondes, and those who resembled and could camouflage themselves. They sent them from ghetto to ghetto, risking their lives tremendously. And by the end of 1941, uh, one of such emissary, Henek, a boy, uh, arrived at Warsaw Ghetto, telling Yitzhak Zuckerman he came from Vilnius. And he told Yitzhak Zuckerman that all his family in Vilnius was murdered in Ponar. And later on, they all viewed how the kids and the whole ghetto was exported to Treblinka. And they took part in the Warsaw Uprising, which I will relate to as what was the uprising. And that is how they ended the war. And we are here in January of 1945, when Warsaw was conquered by the Soviets and liberated. And bear in mind what Yitzhak Zuckerman has been through until then. I mean, if somebody would have come and told me that all my family was murdered, I would actually crush. He didn't crush. He continued to do his work. But only then, in January of 1945, he writes this text. Now, we shall not read all the text. We shall read only uh, the third paragraph. Um, no, maybe this one, because 
it also corresponds with the pictures that we show. I remember vividly the day when the dog, Tsivia and I went to the square. We saw the Soviet tanks and the tank men on the panicles that their faces were solid black from the suit. And around them, everyone was gleeful. Women, children, and men blowing kisses and flowers. And suddenly, this is such a strong sentence. For the first time, I felt like I couldn't stand. Now, you wouldn't understand this, this sentence if you didn't know what he's been through already. This day was the saddest day of my life. I wanted to cry, not from happiness, but from grief. I'm not saying I cried. I'm saying I wanted to cry. This is the first time I wanted to. The kissing tank drivers, the blown flowers towards them, the joyful crowd, the freedom feeling and redemption. And Sivia, the dog and I, standing among the crowd, lonely, orphaned, lost, and know very well that there is no Jewish people anymore. What joy can possibly be? Now, once this was put into words, and he wrote it on the same day, by the way. This is actually the rephrasing of ground zero. The natural reaction to that is what? Despair. I mean, this is the first word that comes into mind. Now, did you ever stop and think, what is the meaning of despair? The meaning of despair is actually not being able. No hope. No hope. That means no action, no, no, no power no to take future. his, no future, exactly. And, and no, no ability to take yourself and lift yourself. And this is a natural feeling after this what we have described. And I've, I've seen that all over the place. He's not the only one, but he put it so nicely into words. So the natural option was despair. But this is not what happened. Now let me tell you, just to make it even more dramatic, Mordechai Nilevich and Zuckerman, at the time they decided to go back to be with their children, not biological children, of course, they're, they're students in the youth movement. They were between the ages of 19 and 21. I often looked at my kids when they were 19, and they were so infantile. I mean, really, children. Imagine the immense responsibility and the immense uh, adultness and, and, and wisdom in that decision. And you know that the Minister of History is a very severe judge because it has the wisdom after years. And the Minister of, of uh, History judged that act as a supreme honor in a supreme flying colors. So, since they did not give up to despair, very soon there they were operative questions to ask. And the first question to ask was, what now? Should we leave the country? Should we stay? What is the essence or the meaning of our survivor? Uh, the crucial question of revenge. Each and every one of them wanted to revenge. There was a big discussion going on. I want to rephrase this discussion because the answers that were given in that discussion, also judged later by the history minister, are of crucial importance for us. The two arguments the two, the two leaders of your argument were Abba Kovner, whom you met in the beginning, and Yitzhak Zuckerman. Abba Kovner said, enough is enough. We have to leave Poland. We have to look how we get to Eretz Israel, and that is our main task today. 
And no less important is revenge. We should kill as many Germans as possible. An eye for an eye, as is said in the Bible. Yitzhak Zuckerman said no. We have to stay here because I believe that there will be additional Jews to come. Remember, we are at the beginning of 1945, January of 1945. Somebody has to be here to be there for them, to prevent them from falling into the hands of despair. We have to bring in life into these dead souls. In brackets, I have to say that the two most vulnerable groups in the process of the final solution were children at the age of uh, zero to 14. And of course, people, what was then considered to be old, 55 plus. It's really how things are changing demographically. Isaac Zuckerman said, we have to start organizing. We have to start what Jewish is so good about, Jewish life, the, the communal help. And Abba Kovner left, and Isaac Zuckerman stayed. About revenge, Isaac Zuckerman said, we cannot educate our young people to revenge. This will actually um, taint our mor moral stand. Abba Kovner tried to revenge. He, this was a kind of a Nebuch Jewish revenge, I have to say. Um, and Yitzhak Zuckerman prevented. He said, the first thing we have to do is to take the young who survived into the process of education. And you were right when you said, when do you give education? When do you invest in education? When you think there is a future. And after Second World War, suddenly they thought there is a future. And the main thing to do is to take our youngsters and bring faith in humanity and in basic life and give it to them and infiltrate it to them. Because the big fear was demoralization, which was also a very natural thing to happen. And again, the judgment of the Minister of History. Yitzhak Zuckerman stayed there. And there were Jews who came from the Soviet Union, those who fle fled into so Actually, so you understand, at the end of Second World War, of the 3.5 million Jews in Poland, on the soil of Poland were 80,000 Jews. That's all. There were an addition 250,000 Jews that fled into the Soviet Union. Actually, most survivors from the Soviet, from the Jew, Polish Jews are those who flee into uh, the Soviet Union. That's all. That's all that was left from the biggest jury existing at that time. But Yitzhak Zuckerman was there. And he gave them hope, and he gave them framework for rehabilitation. And actually, he was one of the most important men in the most important place, in the most import, important timing for the Zionist movement. Because these people decided later on to flee from Poland. And their destination was actually decided by the fact that Yitzhak Zuckerman and his friends were those who organized them. They started the exodus of the European Jews towards Palestine. It takes so much to be entering history and to shape history, and this is what happened here. Yitzhak Zuckerman's way actually prevailed over the survivors. We see no revenge. The survivors who immigrated to Palestine actually called their revenge the, reden the revenge through redemption. I mean, the fact that the Israeli state was born, this is the revenge. And later on, I'll tell you, I, I, you know, my, one of my famous book is about the Eichmann trial. They were the ones who opposed putting Eichmann to death. 
as the sentence, because they said that the greatest punishment for Eichmann is to put him to prison, and every year to take him in a car to see what happened in the Jewish state. This will be his biggest punishment, because he wanted to, to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. When he sees how they strived, how they actually revived sovereignty, that will be his biggest punishment. That was said by survivors. Revenge, revenge as such, as we know it today, was completely remote from the repertoire of the Jews. Uh, I'm going a little bit further now to uh, Israel. Uh, I just want to show you something very interesting. Look at the first categories, this and that. There was a, a population count in Israel in October of 1948, very early after the state was uh, established. And this is these are the numbers of the Israeli population that was here, that, was not, that were no, no, not all survivors of the Holocaust. Just look at the ages 0 to 4. This is, connects a little bit the, for the first time and the last time, I think, in my lecture today to my lecture last night. Um, the age, age group of 0 to 4, you can see that uh, there are 12.2%. Tw uh, uh, and you can see from all the countries of the Shoah, except for Romania, which I will tell you later, it's a, a unique story. You can see that from Czechoslovakia, for instance, the, the rate is 15.7. From Germany, that's the DP camps. The, you know DPs? Uh, displayed person camps, 41.2. The Jews, after Second World War, gave the highest birth rate in the wave of the baby boomers globally. But one of the reasons for that is, of course, the second category. Ages of 5, 14, almost no children. You can see the numbers by 50%. 16.6 children in Israel, uh, not percent in Israel, 8% Poland, 8% Romania, Czechoslovakia, 4.8. You can see, actually, you can see the drama of the demography of the final solution. No children at the age of 5 to 14. Uh, maybe there is one more optimistic uh, number. This is the fourth category, this one. Uh, you can see from Poland, 34.6. Most survivors were at the ages of 17 to 44. This is very important because this is the age when people have families, are working, working force, and in the reality of the state of Israel at these years, they are also fit to be soldiers. And, maybe I didn't mention it before, there are more male survivors than women survivors. Uh, there are many reasons for that, but this is another gender point to discuss. Uh, many children came within Youth Aliyah. Um, maybe I'll, I'll skip that because my time is running very quick. Um, uh, you can see here another, I can, if somebody wants to get the presentation, I'll send it so you can uh, look at the numbers, the specific numbers. There are a couple of, of uh, periods which I'm going to discuss, some of them very briefly and some of them more extensively. In the years 1945 to 47, that's the pre-state, and it's a illegal uh, immigration, 70,000 uh, survivors arrived to Palestine. Then, after the creation of, the, of Israel, that's the mass immigration to Israel mm -hmm. until 52, 350,000 survivors, thousand survivors arrived. That's quite a big number. They consist constitute the largest group of immigrants to Israel at its initial uh, Time. The third one is during the 1950s, uh, another 80,000 came after the, uh, the failure of the anti-communist revolutions in Poland and in Hungary. A total of 500,000. This is, of course, all the numbers are for touched and for best, as, as we say, uh, just to make you understand the, um, the
you can read. <laughs> Two of every three Israelis was a survivor of the Holocaust in the 1950s. This is not only a number, this is an essence. Now I want to show you a film of two minutes. For this, I need uh, one survivor speaking in his own voice, an Israeli survivor, about what we just discussed. Rosh Yehudi patach kfar noah, ma shavru sham beitei sefer shlimim. Se lo avru lelmod, aval kedei lakabel et akcat marak vet akat lechem. Vayiti sham ez shana vachetzi. Shishamu. שולחים לחסל את הילדים, מי שהיה לו איפה לחזור, כל אחד חזר למשפחתו. אני זוכר דבר אחד, מה שזה לא נותן למנוח לבן אדם. כולנו רצנו לשמוע את ראש היהודי רומקוסקי. הוא מעד בכיכר, והוא צעק, ממס גצום וקינדל. אמהות, תתנו את הילדים. הוא רצה לצאת בטח ממה שיותר. ההיסטוריה תשפוט אותו, אני לא יכול לשפוט את רומקוסקי. במאי 42 אבי נפטר בגטו. את אמי ואחותי הגדולה לקחו אותם לחלמו, שם נעלמו. גם כן היינו בקונספורטים האחרונים עם אחותי. הגענו לאושוויץ, שם נעלמה אחותי. לא נשאר לי, לא תמונה. ולא חפץ, ולא שום דבר מהמשפחה. בביתי כפרות בארץ, מונחים בחורים מה שהגיעו מהשואה, באו בודדים כמוני. והתגייסנו לצבא. הם לא הספיקו להקים משפחה. לא הספיקו להשאיר שורש. כמו שבאו מהשואה, נכנסו למלחמת קומוניות ונפלו. ביקשתי מקרן קיימת. תעשו עץ על כל איש. אמרו, אנחנו לא רק נעשה יער, אנחנו נעשה אנדרטה גם כן. הרגשתי את ישראל היפה. הקימו אתר אינטרנט עם כל ההיסטוריה של כל נופל ונופל. מדברים כבר על חמישים ביתי ספר, כל אחד מאמץ חמי שמות. הרי אנשים לא השאירו זכר. אין מי שיזכיר את שמם. אין מי שישים להם פרח. אני מרגיש שאני אימצתי אותם בתור משפחה. two-thirds of the Israeli army in the War of Independence. Uh, this makes their story as immigrants an unprecedented story in the history of immigrations that I was aware of. And I did some um, um, comparative research. It has a very sad story, a very side, sad side of what Judah Sternfeld was speaking about. There were about almost 2,000 survivors who died in the war in Israel after they survived the Second World War. But there is the half glass, which is full. And that is that from the very minute the survivors entered the state of Israel, they became, with the, they, they were full with the feeling that they are the owners of the country. And unlike other stories of immigration, These immigrant survivors became the backbone and the founders of what Israel is made of. And I will show you in a second a couple of, of things. The question is, how come and what kind of Zionism did the survivors bring with them? I don't want to go into a discussion what Zionism is, but I will tell you just this. Their Zionism stemmed from the existential knowledge that without a state, we actually perished. So the existence of a Jewish state bore for them an existential meaning. Only without a state, we are so vulnerable and helpless 
as we were through Second World War. And so, basically, the greatest patriots in the state, until today, those who are still with us, are the survivors. They never take for one day of their life the existence of the state as uh, an obvious fact. Okay. What is the texture of Israel? You could see militarism, culture, sabras, settlements, economy. Military, we already touched, although I could speak about their role in the military. Let me just tell you, no, I will tell you this in a second. Culture, they are the creation of what Israeli culture is all about. Um, the second, the last is Sabras, of course, their children. Settlements, only in the first year of 1949, these European Jews who never knew what agriculture was, you know, the Jews lived in an opposite pyramid. As it gets close to the earth, they are very few. And as it gets to the Luftgeschäften, they were all wide. Suddenly, those Jews from the diaspora created, just in one year, 49 new Moshavim, which are, until today, the most successful Moshavim and Kibbutzim in the state of Israel. This is a phenomena of, of a magnitude. And then, of course, economy, uh, some of the greatest enterprises in Israel, Strauss, the Dan hotels, just to name a few, are uh, the creation of survivors of the Holocaust. Let me just show you this. Many of the survivors came with no families because they were the only survivors in the land. And you can see one of the, of the tombstones. He was 19. This is Moshe Willinger. He was 19 when he died on the, in the Battle of Jerusalem. They didn't know the name of his mother and father. So this place in the tombstone was left empty. This just to give you the notion of the issue. And then this. This is the highest decoration in the Israeli army. Uh, it was uh, designed by uh, Dan Reisinger. Dan Reisinger is uh, the, prize, the Israeli prize winner. He is the father of Israeli graphics. And you can understand what is the yellow, does, does the yellow stand for? The Magen David and, of course, a piece of an olive tree to present uh, the strife for peace. In the War of Independence, which was Israel's hardest war, only 12 people got decorated. It grew up very much in time, but in the War of Independence, only 12 people, four of them were survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, OK, I have to finish at this point. Uh, but um, I, I cannot finish without going to the end, I'm sorry. Uh, and showing you, and it, this is the Ghetto Fighters Museum, the first in the world. You're very much advised to go and see the notion of the establishers. Uh, Where is that museum? It's between Akko and Nahariya. In 2002, uh, in your Jerusalem, there was the last uh, convention, international convention of survivors of the Holocaust. I guess there will be no more. And they published, the survivors published uh, a declaration it's called Our Living Legacy. I think this is a basic educational human document that should be a kind of a motto for every youngster that we meet. 100,000 survivors signed this document. And I want to read with you. I, put, I chose only three paragraphs, but you can understand what is the message the survivors are giving us. The memory of the Shoah is continuous and dark, exposing the ugly and naked fact of consu consummate inhumanity that threatens the very nature and stature of civilization itself. There is always, you know, a tension between the universalistic and the specific Jewish issue in the story of the Shoah. See what the survivors are telling us. The Holocaust, which established the standard for absolute evil, is the universal heritage of all civilized people. The lessons of the Holocaust must form the cultural code for education towards human values, democracy, human rights, tolerance, and patience, and opposition to racism and totalitarian ideologies. From Har HaZikaron in Jerusalem, the words of Rabbi Hillel need to ring out loud and clear. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow men, human being. This is actually the end of the declaration. 
I, I know not of any other document that is so profoundly human, basically human, than the Declaration of the Survivors. And this is actually their legacy, who, who they form for us to take in our pockets every day and ask ourselves every day in the night, what did we do today as survivors? Thank you. of and condition of the archival material on which you relied to do this research? Um, the, the two main archives which I used uh, through the years are the State Archive, because it's already the, the State of Israel. Um, maybe I should elaborate a little bit on that. And the second archive, of course, was the IDF archive and the Kibbutzim archives. I guess I was asking, I should have been more specific about the archives of the countries from which um, Jewish communities were victimized and survived. This is not the, this kind of research. This is actually the research of the uh, survivors after immigrating to Israel, because they are the largest immigrant survivors group. And I was really interested in the aftermath. I'm, I'm not, when I did the work about the Slovak Jews, I went to the Slovak state archives and also the Jewish communities archives, which were left, some of it was lost during the war. But this is a completely different research. This is a very Israeli research in, in, in character, but not in implication, because in implication, I think it has basically a very human uh, general human um, aim and, and substance. Um, when I wrote my PhD, I took a lot of um, material uh, from all Israeli archives, but these were state archives, kibbutzim archives, the government archive, uh, the IDF archive, the, kibbutzim, the um, Haganah archives. And you know, when you take establishment documents, it's a completely different uh, view than when you go to the authentic documents of the population you're dealing with. These are harder to find. So when I finished my PhD and it got the attention it got because it was the first, um, I was approached by one of the survivors organizations. There are 168 organizations of survivors in Israel doing each and every one of them research into the whereabouts of their own people. And it is the largest uh, group of survivors in Israel, and they asked me to write the history of their organization. And I asked them, do you have materials? And they said, you just, just don't believe how much material we have. And they showed me four rooms like that, full of material from the day the establishment was organized in the DP camps until the day I entered the, the archive. And sometimes you don't know what the people wrote to the government, but you only have the government's answer. Now, an establishment always sees itself as the center of doing. And suddenly I understand what I did wrong in my PhD, although it got decorated. <laughs> I did some very bad thing there. I didn't give voice to the survivors themselves. And all the 30 years from then, I'm giving voice to the survivors. And I'm using only material that survivors wrote, published, uh, wrote at the times, memories, uh, you know, all kinds of landsmanschafts. What did they do to accept, to absorb? Because survivors were never absorbed. Nobody accepted them. They penetrated forcefully into the Israeli society while shaping culture and, and army and all that. Nobody ever took care of them. This is a huge story. Uh, and ever since then, I'm doing only work on materials from the eyes of the survivors. This is a, a, a very good methodological mistake which taught me a lot. <laughs>